we're ready to start now. Okay? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I know you're getting out at 1.15 this afternoon, so 35 minutes of your close and undivided attention is going to really help you, I think, when you start reading Anne Frank's diary, which I guess you're all going to do pretty soon. Um, I think you're all reading another book called The Giver, but I'm not going to talk about that book uh, today. Um, I want to uh, try to tell you a little bit before you start reading the diary um, of who Anne Frank was and the kind of world that she lived in. Because this diary that you're going to read, I, you may not know much about it right now, but um, you should know that more people have read this diary than almost any other book in the world not including the Bible uh, or other uh, important religious texts. It's been translated into more than 60 languages. It's sold in the tens of millions of copies. This is one of the most important pieces of writing of the entire 20th century. And the life of Anne Frank and the world that she lived in and the diary that she produced uh, even though these things are from, you know, your grandparents or your grandparents' generation, they have a lot to say to you and, and to us, to, to all of us, about our own lives and about the choices that we make and about how we relate to other people and about our responsibilities to other people. It's, it's all in the diary. And... Beyond the diary, it's in the life and the world of, of Anne Frank. So, I think that what I'm going to show you, and much of this is what your teacher will be telling you, would, would have told you. Uh, I'm going to try to pack a lot of information into 30 minutes. Okay? It's okay. 1.15, you're finished. You can uh, walk out of here. Um, but I want you to have some information that will help you to understand Anne Frank and, and the diary that she wrote a little bit better. So, so this is me, Stephen Gaze, and I teach at UNI, and I direct the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Education, which, which tries to help people learn about uh, what we call the Holocaust and some of the other terrible events that have taken place uh, in the last hundred years or so, some of you may have heard about Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur, uh, all kinds of places that are simply repeating uh, many of the crimes that brought about the death of Anne Frank and almost everyone that she knew. So, uh, I want you to take a couple of seconds and look at this photograph. This is Anne Frank. And I want you just to think about it for a couple of seconds, whatever, whatever immediate impressions come to mind. I don't see anyone here who looks exactly like Anne Frank. I see some people who look somewhat like Anne Frank, but maybe one of the things that crossed your mind when you first looked at the photograph is that First of all, this is someone your age, and someone who you wouldn't be surprised to see walking uh, in the hallways of this school. I mean, you might you might say to yourself, "This isn't anyone I know," or it doesn't look exactly like a Bunger Middle School student, but uh, she wouldn't look that out of place. And this is why it's so important that you're reading this diary at this time in your life. You may well come back to this diary as an adult or when you have children of your own and you want to introduce them to important people and important uh, pieces of writing. But, but this is a diary written by someone your age, someone who was in many ways, maybe more ways than you know, uh, like you. 
someone with whom you can identify um, in a lot of different ways. Um, Annalise Marie Frank, that, that was her name, we call her Anne Frank, the family pronounced their name as Frank, I'll call them Frank, uh, was born in Germany, which many people don't think about or know. You know, we associate her with the country in which uh, her family went into hiding, Holland, uh, in the city of Amsterdam, but she was born in Germany. Her father's and her mother's families had lived in Germany for hundreds of years. They were, they thought of themselves as German citizens first and foremost. They also happened to be Jewish, but they thought of themselves first and foremost as Germans. They loved Germany, they loved German life, German culture. She was the second daughter of Otto and Edith Frank. Her elder sister, Margot, was three years older. And when Anne was three and a half years old, something happened in Germany that would change the course of history. Adolf Hitler, the head of the, what we call the Nazi Party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, became the highest, most powerful uh, leader in Germany, the Chancellor of Germany, and immediately uh, that government began passing laws and putting regulations into effect that would make life difficult for many, many Germans, but especially for the Jews of Germany, of whom there were about a half million, a little bit more. Only about 1% of Germany's population, but this half million people were targeted for persecution with the hope that they would find life in Germany so unbearable that they would leave. Anne's father could see what was happening, and he decided very early to get the family out of Germany, across the border, into Holland. So just a few months after Hitler came to power, Otto Frank, Otto Frank moved his family to Amsterdam. This was a wealthy family. The Frank family had owned a bank in Germany. The bank went out of business, not because of Hitler, uh, but because of economic problems. But they had a lot of money. And so it was possible for them to pick up and move to another country. Anne didn't come until 1934. She stayed behind uh, for several months with, with relatives. Um, in Amsterdam, uh, Otto Frank ran a new business out of that building, which is shaded in blue. You can see it's on a it, it's on a street, which instead of being paved is a canal. Amsterdam is a city of canals. And behind that building, no one would know this, but behind that building, uh, another building had been built, a kind of addition or annex to this building. And that would be where Anne Frank and her family and four other people would live in hiding for two years, from 1942 until 1944. Uh, this is uh, an advertisement for Otto Frank's business. He, he manufactured and sold pectin, which some of you may know is used in making jam and jelly and other food products. And he was very successful, uh, in part because he had so very, very good employees who would become uh, extremely important in helping to protect this family when they went into hiding in 1942. So the family was, was continued to be well off uh, even in their new country. But I want you to think about this. Uh, Anne Frank, when she was four years old, was a refugee. Now, we often think about refugees in a, in a different context. But her family left their home country because they were being persecuted. And they came to another country uh, and had to build their lives over again. For Anne, that meant learning another language. 
know, she first learned German and now she had to learn Dutch, which is quite similar to German, but, but still she had to learn uh, another language. Uh, here is Anne with her one of her best friends, Hanna Goslar, and this uh, building is the very modern uh, complex of apartments in which the Frank family lived. Um, as I say, they lived quite comfortably, even in their new country in Amsterdam. You, you can see what this says, Anne Frank was not an angel. We think about Anne Frank today as kind of the representative, the symbol of all of the innocent children who were murdered during the Holocaust. But I think you'll understand the diary better, and I think you'll appreciate Anne Frank more if you understand that she wasn't an angel. She was, a, she was an ordinary young girl. She had her positive qualities, and she had some things that drove people crazy, just like all of you, probably. When you read the diary, and now you can read it in its entirety, not the way it was first published when her father took out a lot of sections of the diary. But now, when you can read the whole diary, you'll find that Anne Frank uh, criticized her almost everyone, most of all her parents. Uh, like other children her age, and she was 13 when she started keeping the diary, uh, she often found her parents very embarrassing. They said the wrong things, they dressed the wrong way, they didn't understand her, and she would write this down. Uh, she was very hard on her mother. But she had a comment about almost everything. You probably know kids like this. You know, they, they, they have something to say about almost everything. And, uh, and Anne Frank was notorious in her school for always talking. I shudder to think what she would be like if she was sitting in a group like this. She'd probably be talking to her neighbor until her teacher would go over and tell her to keep quiet. And she was one of these people who always thought she knew things better than anyone else. In fact, the friend of, uh, the mother of her friend uh, was quoted as saying, God knows everything, but Anne Frank knows everything better. That is, that's, that's what Anne thinks, that she, that she knows everything, that she knows more uh, than anyone else. And I don't want to portray Anne, you know, negatively. But she was an ordinary young teenager. And I think, I think when you understand that, you'll appreciate even more the quality of her writing, the, uh, the power of this diary to, to, to share uh, with us, the readers, you know, what she was thinking and feeling about this life that she was leading uh, in, in hiding. Like a lot of other people her age in Europe, she had a pen pal. In her case, and in her sister's case, in Iowa. This is something that almost no one in Iowa knows anything about. Um, but for a short period of time, she uh, had a pen pal, a young girl her age by the name of Juanita Wagner, who lived on a farm down here in southeast Iowa, in Danville, Iowa. Waterloo Cedar Falls is up here, but this is only about two hours away from us. And um, this is the one letter that still exists from this uh, correspondence. Uh, we think that she wrote another letter, but it's disappeared. And the pen pal correspondence didn't last for that long because World War II was going on, and it was very difficult for mail to travel uh, back and forth between Europe and the United States. Um, but this letter was written by Anne in English. Uh, her father was teaching her English. Her father spoke English very well, and I'll explain why he did uh, in just a little while. Um, 
you wouldn't be able to read that very easily, and we're not going to read this whole text, but she wrote the letter on April 29, 1941, a little bit more than a year before the family would go into hiding. And um, uh, she also sent, along with the letter, a postcard, a typical scene of Amsterdam, one of the canals. Um, postcards were, were something that Anne collected. That was one of her hobbies. And by the time that the family went into hiding, she had a collection uh, of more than, well, by the time she wrote the letter to her pen pal, she had more than 800 postcards. Some of them were photographs of Hollywood movie stars. Because Anne Frank's great dream was to become a Hollywood star. You know, in, in that sense, she's kind of typical. Well, maybe today people think about going on American Idol or Dancing with the Stars. Or, but she wanted to be, uh, become a celebrity. That was her great dream. Um, uh, here's a picture of her. Uh, in her school, she went to uh, the Montessori school, private school. Um, and uh, here's a picture of her ice skating, which of course is the national pastime in uh, Holland. The skating on the frozen canals and, and uh, ponds. Um, you know, in many ways, her life was uh, as normal as could be considering that she was living in a different country. Uh, this is a photo of her family, her father, mother on the right, her sister, uh, Margot, and then there's Anne uh, in the middle. Uh, pretty normal life under the circumstances. And when I say under the circumstances, what I mean is that in May of 1940, just seven years after the Frank family moved away from Germany, Germany invaded and occupied Holland. Here's the German army rolling into Amsterdam. This is Amsterdam uh, being greeted by some of the Dutch citizens. And uh, as soon as the Germans were there, uh, some of the same stuff started happening. Everyone had to turn in their radios because they were afraid people would listen to uh, the enemy broadcast. Uh, the Jews living in Holland, and there were a lot of Jews living in Holland, and a lot more who had come from other countries, uh, escaping from Nazi Germany. Uh, they had to turn in their bicycles. Everyone in Holland rode a bicycle to work, for errands. That's how people got around. And so to turn in your bicycle meant that you were you know, very, very difficult to get around. Now, one rule, one restriction, uh, one law after another. But still, still, the family uh, was able to live as best they, they could. Um, this is the photo of herself that Anne Frank loved, liked best. Uh, she wrote on this photograph in October of 1942, after the family had gone into hiding, that when she applied for a job in Hollywood, this is the photo she would send, because this is the one she thought made her look uh, her best. Um, that's another way in which she was a typical young teenager. She cared a lot about how she looked and what people thought about her appearance. Um, and I, you know, I've said this a couple of times now, but I think it's, it's really important if you're going to understand the diary. Sure, she was a very, very talented writer, extremely talented writer. In terms of how she re reacted to the world around her, she was very mature. But she was, you know, she was a 13-year-old teenager, and a 14-year-old, and then a 15-year-old teenager. She was a in many ways, very much like teenagers in every place and in every time. One thing that we've just learned about in the last five years, because some letters were discovered that no one knew about, is that in 1941, that is after Germany occupied Holland, 
but before the family went into hiding. Otto Frank tried to get the family out of Holland to the United States or to Cuba or someplace, any place. People were desperate to get out of Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, we won't go through this whole thing, but Otto Frank had gone to university with the son of one of the owners of Macy's department store. How many of you have heard of Macy's? Yeah? Okay. Which, of course, was based in New York City. And uh, Otto Frank, as a younger man, had gone to New York City and worked for a year in Macy's department store through the connection that he had with his uh, university classmate. And, of course, he learned English, became very fluent in English, and tried to get this family, the Strauss family, one of the owners of Macy's, to help get the Frank family out of Holland. In the end, they weren't able to do it. Uh, it was almost impossible, especially in 1941, for people to get out of Europe. But, um, you know, it shows that he was always trying to think ahead, to, to always trying to find a way to make the family's situation better. And um, we get to June 12, 1942. Uh, it, it's, it's obvious that uh, they're not going to get out of Holland. Um, and it's Anne's 13th birthday. She'd been bugging her father for weeks for a diary that she had seen in a shop window. And sure enough, on her birthday, she gets this famous diary with a plaid cover. And she wrote on her birthday, this is the first thing that, part of the first thing that she wrote in the diary, she said, I hope I'll be able to confide everything in you as I've never been able to confide in anyone. And I hope you'll be a great source of comfort and support. She didn't know that uh, within a little bit more than a month, that diary would have to become the substitute for all of her friends because the family would go into hiding and for two years they would never leave that building in which they were hiding. So her diary really did become the ears of a friend to whom she was speaking. You'll see when you read the diary that many of the entries are written like letters addressed to an imaginary friend named Kitty. Many of the entries begin, Dear Kitty or Dearest Kitty. And she's, she's using the diary you know, in place of a real friend uh, with whom to have a conversation with. Anne didn't know this, but on her birthday, her father was already planning to have the family going, go into hiding. He was already moving things from their apartment into this hiding place. And in July of 1942, when Anne's sister got a letter telling her she had a report for forced labor, which could be very, very dangerous, uh, her father decided we're going into hiding now. Her sister didn't report for forced labor. Instead, the family went into this hiding place. And they were there from June of 19, from, I'm sorry, from July of 1942 until August 4th, 1944, for more than two years. They lived in hiding, never leaving this place, not really even able to look out the windows uh, because the back of this hiding place faced the back of other buildings, and it was too dangerous. Uh, when you read the diary, you will be reading the writing of someone who, if she couldn't become a Hollywood star, wanted to be a journalist or a writer. And this is what makes Anne Frank's diary different from the other diaries written by young people. We do have a lot of them. There are more than a hundred diaries written during this time by young people that have been translated into English. There are hundreds more that have not been translated into English. Um, but, but 
But she was using this diary as a way to practice her skills as a writer. She wasn't just recording her ideas. She was, she was working at the craft of writing. She, she believed that writing allowed her to record everything, all her thoughts, ideals, and fantasies. Now, I'm not going to go through this thing, but uh, this whole thing, but I just want to point out to you that uh, you know, Anne Frank, for many people, is the sort of symbol of this huge event that we call the Holocaust. Maybe some of you have heard that in these years between 1933 and 1945, the history of Nazi Germany, six million Jews in Europe were murdered, and millions more people of other faiths, other backgrounds, also uh, died. I'm not talking about soldiers, I'm talking about civilians. Of those six million Jews of Europe who were murdered, a million and a half of them were children, 16 or younger. A million and a half, that's half the population of Iowa today. You can't, none of us can really understand what that means. A million and a half children. Six million people. So Anne Frank has become, in some ways, uh, the, the symbol, the representative of all of those people who were murdered. That's okay. But you have to understand that, in many ways, the Frank family's experience was not the typical experience. First of all, they were wealthy. Second of all, the father was able to see things uh, that most people didn't understand were going to happen. Uh, third, um, they, they planned this hiding so that they could live very comfortably. They had enough food. They had enough food, they had lots of books, they had, they had a radio, which was illegal, but, you know, hiding was illegal too, so what difference did it make? And most of all, most of all, they had people who were protecting them. They had these employees of Mr. Frank who risked their well-being and their lives to protect uh, the Frank family, and the other four people who were living in hiding. In Holland, as well as elsewhere in Europe, uh, anyone who offered assistance to Jews could be put to death. That was the, the penalty for helping Jews uh, in Holland or anywhere else. So everyone who helped to protect the hiding place of the Frank family was putting their own life at risk. And the Frank family had the assistance of a half dozen or more loyal employees, people you know, who, who were really putting their own lives in danger. This was not typical. Most people who were being persecuted, hunted down by the by Nazi Germany, couldn't count on anyone. Not a neighbor, not a friend, not a former business uh, associate. Uh, people didn't want to risk their own well-being in most cases. So the Frank family was exceptional in that way. And uh, there were, throughout Europe, thousands of people who did uh, try to help people in need, but probably less than 1% of the entire population. Less than one person in 100 decided to do something to try to make the lives of other people a little bit better. But once the family was arrested, uh, then their experience became much more typical of people in the Holocaust. But of course, the diary doesn't talk about that. Because the last entry of the diary is August 1st, 1944, and three days later, the family 
was arrested. Um, a couple more things. I know we're getting close to 115. In March of 1944, a representative of the Dutch government made a speech on British radio, which the Frank family listened to, saying that after the war, the Dutch government was going to collect whatever writing people had done and put together this large history of Holland under German occupation. And when Anne Frank heard this, she went to her diary and said, you know, there are things that I've written here that I could write better now. And so, not in the diary, but on loose pieces of paper, she, she went back and started rewriting and adding to things that she'd written two years or one year earlier. And when the family was arrested on August 4th, 1944, that diary and all of those papers were just thrown on the floor. And the family was taken away, and one of Mr. Frank's employees collected all of that, which is illegal, and put it in a drawer and kept it in case someone from the family returned. And uh, so you have today, the, the possibility of reading not just the diary as she wrote it, but as she rewrote it in the last months uh, before the family was arrested. Now, um, just quickly, so that you understand what happened after the diary ends. The family was taken to a prison in Amsterdam. I mean, what happened to them is what happened to everyone who was uh, rounded up by the authorities. And after a few days in the prison, they were sent to a camp, uh, what's called an internment camp, in the northern part of Holland called Vesterborg. It's a very primitive place, wooden barracks. And from there, a few weeks later, they were put on one of those uh, horrible trains, the cattle cars, and sent to the most notorious of all of the concentration camps, Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, the place where more people were murdered than anywhere else in the history of Nazi Germany. This is where Anne Frank's mother would die. Uh, but uh, Anne and her sister Margot only spent a few weeks in, uh, uh, a couple months actually, in Auschwitz. And then they were sent to another camp back in Germany called Bergen-Belsen. Uh, that's probably one of the nicer views of the camp. Uh, this was a terrible place. There wasn't any food. Uh, all kinds of diseases were, be were spread in the camp. It was the winter, and uh, people were dying every day by the hundreds. Sometime in March of 1945, just a month before the camp was liberated by the British Army, uh, Anne Frank and her sister died. We think they died of typhus, which was a terrible disease going through all of the camps, but it was probably a combination of hunger, exposure, they lived in tents. They didn't even live in a wooden building. <coughs> we don't know exactly when she died. We don't know where her remains are buried because uh, most of the dead prisoners were just put into mass graves. Um, we just don't know uh, when she died. Um, and this gravestone that you can see is not a real gravestone. It's a memorial stone. We just don't know. Uh, where we can find exactly All right. I hope you enjoyed the time. Oh, no.
Now, you know.